Welcome to the High Acts Bible Study Podcast. This is Zach, and I'm here with Michael, and we are looking forward to reading and understanding the Bible together, one passage at a time. And for today's passage, we're looking in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19. We're looking at the second half of the chapter, verses 16 to 30. This is a passage of Scripture that introduces us to a famous character who has often been referred to as the rich young man. And so in light of this character, we are entitling today's episode, The Man Who Thought He Was Rich. So if you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to turn to Matthew 19 and read for yourselves verses 16 to 30. You can pause the video while you do that. And after you're done, we'll look forward to digging into God's Word together. All right, Zach, looking at Matthew 19, this is one of those passages where if somebody came up to me and said, I read this story this morning in my quiet time, but I didn't really feel like it was that relevant, I would feel a lot of sympathy for that person. Yeah, I mean, on a surface level reading, it can seem like the Bible is addressing a specific kind of person. And if you don't see yourself as that kind of person, then you might be tempted to immediately think, well, this passage of scripture doesn't apply to me. But I think what we'll see as we get into the passage is that what Jesus is trying to show us through his interaction with the rich young man is that what all people need, whether materially rich or materially poor, young or old, is we need to have in our heart of hearts a reorienting of what it is that we value and how we understand what true wealth really is. Jumping into the passage, I read it as two conversations. There's the conversation that Jesus has with the rich man, which is really clear. And then there's that other conversation that Jesus has with the disciples, which is sort of, though, based on that conversation that he has with the rich young man. So when you come to a passage in the scriptures, especially in the Gospels, and there are characters coming and having conversations with Jesus, and you notice that a lot of questions are being asked, those are the sorts of things that you want to pay attention to and try and figure out why are all of these questions here and how is God's word using those questions to help me see what it is that God wants me to see from this particular passage. Yeah, I can see how that's actually really helpful in this one just because of the number of questions both that the rich young man asked at the beginning and then the disciples asked towards the end. The funny thing is I would have focused more on the other element of story which is kind of this really intriguing character of the rich young man who, who both seems to think that he's a good person based on his answers within the conversation, but also seems to maybe not feel right simultaneously because he's coming to Jesus and asking a question about how he can have eternal life. I mean, from the outside looking in, this guy has the appearance of having everything going for him. I mean, it just seems like he is absolutely killing it in life. And yet at the same time, he seems to have this inner tension within himself that he just can't simply resolve. So even with all the wealth, even with all the seeming self-perceived morality, he is still coming to Jesus in verse 16 and asking questions of eternity. And even in verse 20, the young man asked this question that is haunting him, what do I still lack? And he apparently doesn't really like Jesus's answer. Because by the end of the conversation, he just walks away. The way that this interaction ends between Jesus and the rich young man is not the way that you would have expected this to end. What I mean is usually when someone comes and asks the question, how do I become a Christian? Which is essentially what this guy was asking. You expect a conversation like that to end with someone actually becoming a Christian. I mean, you think of the Philippian jailer in Acts 16. Paul, what must I do to be saved? Well, the very next page of that story, the Philippian jailer and his whole household are converted to Christ. And yet here's this guy who's come to Jesus with this question, but he has this massive blind spot that Jesus is trying to gently show him by pointing him to the goodness of God in verse 17, and then even calling his attention to the second half of the Ten Commandments with the law in verses 18 and 19. And what he's trying to show the rich young man that if he would actually come to see the goodness of God's character, it would lead to a revelation of himself that he's not all that he thinks he's cracked up to be. And what he really needs in his heart of hearts is a change in his understanding of what it means to be rich. I get the sense that 
part of him actually wants that change to come because he's walking away sorrowful, but he just can't bring himself to do it. The power that riches can have on our heart can be so gripping that it can deceive us into missing what our real need actually is. And it's a deception that's almost so strong that it can't be overcome based on what Jesus says about how with man this is totally impossible. Yeah, and Jesus gives that now famous illustration in verse 24 where he says, it's actually easier for a horse-sized animal, and I say that because not many of us see camels walking around (laughs) where we live, uh, a horse-sized animal to fit through the tiny little hole at the top of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter into the kingdom. And so he's saying, (laughs) it's never going to happen. You can't push that animal through that tiny little hole. It's impossible. Mm-hmm. But yet at the same time, it, it must be a little bit because because Peter's the opposite of this guy. So Peter has left his fishing business, even if it was small, and he has left his family up in Galilee. Yeah, so something has clearly happened inside of the disciples and especially Peter, as he's mentioned here, to where they have actually moved from, I love the things of this world and I will view myself as a rich person if I accumulate those things, to now saying, I'm leaving that behind because now I have found you, Jesus, my true treasure. And so something has happened inside of Peter that only God could have done. Peter's value system has been rewired, and he recognizes that. And yet, even though that's happened, he still has this question that if you follow Jesus for any amount of time, sooner or later, you will also have this question. Is all of this really worth it? Is trading a life of pursuing great possessions and worldly success worth following you? To which Jesus says in verses 28 and 29, oh, you have no idea how worth it it really is. And it's so cool to think that now, 2,000 years later, Peter every day is still experiencing more of that as he's with Jesus right now. Absolutely, because what Peter is seeing now and what all true believers who have been saved because of God's power and grace alone will one day see is the value and the worth of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ himself, sitting on his rich and glorious throne, worshipped by all creation. And even giving this promise at the end of verse 29 and saying, look, even if you have days when it doesn't seem worth it to give up all worldly success and great possessions to follow me, I am promising you, if you do it for my name's sake, a day is coming soon when you will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. So keep on going. Keep letting the value system of your heart being rewired time and time and time again and not falling into the deceitfulness of worldly riches, but seeing the value and worth of Christ more and more and more. So for those of you who are listening, we have some questions coming up that are both summarizing what we've talked about and helping you identify what's most valuable in your heart right now. And our hope is that if it's not Jesus, that it will become Jesus because he actually is the most valuable person in the world.